In today's video, we'll be breaking down how every Tudor died. This includes kings, queens, prince and princesses from the Tudor dynasty. Did Henry VIII explode and did Elizabeth I really die from depression? Stay tuned in this video and you will find out. Whether you're studying for an assessment or you're just really interested in royal history, hopefully this video will inform you of something new. And without further ado, let's move on to the video. This family only had three reigning generations, which is astounding for English history standards. There are only five Tudor monarchs in total between 1485 and 1603. If we include Lady Jane Grey, since many people believe she was not a de facto monarch, and that her surname was Grey and not Tudor. Now, I will definitely do a video at some point covering just the monarchs of the Tudor dynasty, but I think it's much richer to do a video covering all members of the Tudor dynasty, since there's some really fascinating and underappreciated figures in this family, overshadowed by one man and one woman in particular. Also, side note, I won't be including illegitimate issue in this video. For example, I will not be including Henry's bastard son, the Duke of Richmond, because according to English feudal standards, an illegitimate son cannot carry the same surname as the father. So without further ado, let's finally start with our first ever monarch of this dynasty, Henry VII. So Henry VII was truly a remarkable king. Although he is mostly superseded by his more infamous son, Henry VII came to the throne through force in 1485, using a corsus belli through his mother, who was the relative of the last Lancastrian king of England, Henry VI. The York side of the Plantagenets had not only torn the Lancaster side of the family to shreds, but were now turning inward, putting young princes in the tower and neglecting their wives in favour of their own yeast. Yeast? What? And neglecting their wives in favour of their own niece. Yes, I'm talking about Richard III here and so on. When Henry VII took the throne, adversity did not stop there. Throughout his reign, he restored solidarity to the kingdom, fighting off rebellions and young pretenders. One of the most noble acts on this part was his marriage to the York princess Elizabeth. Although this match was arranged, the two had a very happy marriage and produced seven children. Now, let's move on to the deaths. The first Tudor to die in this family was neither the king or the queen, but their eldest son, Arthur. Now, Prince Arthur had recently married the Aragonese princess, Catherine of Aragon. Yet, before they were able to conceive a child, he caught a malign vapour. It's unclear exactly what killed Arthur, but it's likely tuberculosis or a bad form of influenza. Catherine too caught the disease, so we know it's infectious, but she survived. Some scholars have suggested that Arthur was one of the first victims of a sweating sickness, a rather unique disease in history which causes the sickened to sweat profusely and weaken over the next hours. However, this is unlikely as the real bouts of sweating sickness occurred much later in the Tudor period, over 20 years later. So the verdict for this video is that Arthur died of influenza. With Arthur gone, the only other male besides the king was Prince Henry, who at the time of his brother's death was not much over 10 years old. Now, this is an important thing because it relates to our next death. With the heir gone and the spare now upgraded to the heir, Henry and Elizabeth faced another task, producing another son. In a rather awful Spanish princess, we see Queen Elizabeth already pregnant at the time of Arthur's death, but in real history, Elizabeth was not with child when her eldest son died in 1502. Unfortunately, not all of Elizabeth's six children had survived infancy. She had a son, Edmund, and a daughter, Elizabeth, who died very young, shortly after they were born. Nonetheless, Elizabeth acknowledged the importance of providing more issue, so she conceived for a seventh time by the age of 36. By her 37th birthday, she had given birth prematurely to a daughter, Catherine, named after her daughter-in-law, Catherine of Aragon. Princess Catherine died, followed by her mother, Elizabeth York, died from childbed fever. Queen Elizabeth's death was disastrous to say the least. Henry VII's minister suggested he remarry in an effort to sire more sons, yet he refused. He reportedly cried consistently and only did so in front of his own mother, embarrassed that his grief had tarnished his masculinity. 
Fast forward a few years to 1509, and Henry VII's health seriously declined. He succumbed to tuberculosis, with royal historians having a more conclusive evidence that this disease killed him. With the death of Henry VII, his only surviving son, Henry VIII, became king, and he immediately married his brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon. Now, we're not entirely sure why, but the primary reason was because Henry was in love with Catherine, plus the fact that she was a royal princess, providing England with some very powerful alliances in mainland Europe. Now, the issue with the 1510s is that we don't know exactly how many Tudor deaths occurred in this period. This is because Catherine of Aragon's pregnancies and childbirths are disputed. What we do know conclusively is that a son born in 1511 died only six weeks after his birth, completely demoralising his parents. Nonetheless, Catherine, at 26, was still young enough to conceive again. We're not entirely sure why their son died. Catherine had already suffered a loss of a child the year before her son's birth, miscarrying a daughter. Interestingly, Catherine remained in confinement for almost four months after this delivery because she believed she was carrying twins. No other child came, however, and she returned to the marriage bed sometime in May 1510. Now, if Catherine immediately got pregnant again, she would have carried her son for eight months, which means that he was premature. Although the baby lived at least six weeks, it's likely that his premature status contributed to the infant death. Catherine conceived four times after their son's death. In 1513, Catherine gave birth to a stillborn son. A year later, we know from Thomas Cromwell that Catherine gave birth to another stillborn son. Luckily, in 1516, she produced a healthy child. Finally, a daughter. So when she was born, Henry was a little disappointed that she was not a male. Nonetheless, Catherine was only 31 at the time and she conceived five times already. I think it's likely that Henry had not given up hope since she was still deemed fertile. Interestingly, Catherine conceived only once more and gave birth to a stillborn daughter at the age of 33. Now, I'm not entirely sure why Catherine did not fall pregnant in her mid-30s, but historians have provided several factors. Number one, Henry most likely stopped sleeping with her that often. This is evidenced by the fact that the number of mistresses he took after the year 1518 increased rather sharply. Number two, however, is the fact that Catherine punished herself over her children's deaths, which is incredibly sad. Unfortunately, in the Tudor times, women were blamed for their own child's premature death, especially if it occurred in the womb. Catherine believed that it showed God's displeasure with her. Because of this, she starved herself, which likely reduced her fertility dramatically. For the next decade, there isn't any Tudor death, which is uncommon for this family. However, the next death happened in 1533, but it was another inconclusive cause. Mary Tudor was the younger sister of Henry VIII. She was once the Queen of France, but fell in love with one of Henry's best friends, Charles Brandon. They secretly got married and had four children. Now, Mary dies in 1533, but we're not sure why. It's likely that she was not pregnant, nor had a pregnancy-related death, since her relationship with Charles was broken down before this point. It's likely that she died during the bout of sweating sickness, however. Unfortunately, the 1530s is plagued by female death, so listen closely. By 1533, Henry had secretly married his mistress, Anne Boleyn, who had finally allowed Henry to sleep with her before this point. This is because she conceived in December 1532, and in September she gave birth to a daughter, Elizabeth. Unfortunately, Henry VIII was bitterly upset over his child being a daughter, but Anne was confident that she would fall pregnant soon again. She was correct. In 1534, we have records detailing Anne's new pregnancy. Unfortunately, she had a stillbirth later that year. It's likely that the child was male since Cromwell reports how Henry VIII questioned him about whether it would be possible to divorce Anne. In 1535, Anne was pregnant again. Catherine of Aragon, however, was dying at this point from cancer. She had finally laid to rest in January 1536, meaning that Henry was now, in the eyes of all Christians, no longer married to his first wife. Now, if Henry produced a son, the child would undoubtedly be considered legitimate. In celebration of his wife's first death, seriously inappropriate by the way, Henry participated in a joust, which he was grievously wounded. He lay in a coma shortly afterward, which sent his pregnant wife, Anne Boleyn, into a massive panic attack. 
and Anne miscarried five days later. By this point, Henry refused to sleep with Anne and her days were numbered. Henry fabricated evidence of Anne's supposed adultery and treason. In reality, Anne was innocent, but what Henry wanted, Henry got. In May 1536, the same year as her rival Catherine, Anne died from beheading. Unfortunately, the series of female death does not stop with Anne. With Anne gone, Henry married his new favourite, Jane Seymour, who finally became pregnant in 1537. She produced a son, the long-awaited male heir for Henry, yet Jane was exhausted from childbirth. Within days, it was clear that Jane was dying from an infection. So now would be a pertinent time to have a little break in this video. If you haven't already, try and get a drink of water or a snack or anything to keep you going because there's going to be a lot more complicated deaths to come. The next two on our list to die is Henry VIII's older sister, Margaret, who married the King of Scotland. Now, Margaret has a truly remarkable life, which I won't be disclosing here, but by the time she died in 1541, she had been married three times and had an army of children, most of whom died young. She died in Scotland after having an interesting time fleeing Scotland for much of her life. Anyway, the cause of her death is what the Tudors would have called the palsy, which refers to a stroke. Once 1542 hits, another wife of Henry VIII, Catherine Howard, is to meet her untimely end. Now, Catherine Howard is probably one of the most misunderstood queens in English history, and especially the most misunderstood queen of Henry VIII. In Britain, we have a historian called David Starkey, and he said some pretty awful things about Catherine, one of them being that she was a silly little slut and a complete airhead. In reality, Catherine was the victim of abuse throughout her life, controlled by powerful men around her. She was tried for her past relationship with a courtier and found guilty, leading to her execution. The next Tudor to die is, well, look who we have here, Henry VIII. So, in my video here, I mentioned that Henry VIII exploded, which is partly correct. Now, the true cause of Henry's death is a much debated and contested topic by historians all around the world. Before he died in 1547, we knew of several issues with the king's health, the main one including gout. Revisionist scholars likely advanced the cause of death to be sexual, owing to the fact that he was unable to produce another child after Edward's birth in 1537. Additionally, Henry had a terrible ulcer on his leg following his joust industry in 1536. But for simplistic purposes, I will conclude that Henry VIII died for a multitude of these afflictions. Upon Henry's death, Edward VI came to the throne, a sickly nine-year-old boy. The person after Henry VIII to die next was his final wife, Catherine Parr. A year after his death, she had married her sweetheart, Thomas Seymour. By the age of her late 30s, she believed herself that she was unable to get pregnant. After all, she had had three husbands previously and had not gotten pregnant at any time. However, with Thomas, she did. And this made her very anxious because most women of her age, as a first time mother, died. Unfortunately for her, she did when she gave birth to a daughter. In January, he complained of fevers and chills, and by May of that year, court physicians were unanimous that he would not survive the summer. He passed away on the 10th of July, 1553, from consumption, although there were rumours of poisoning because, well, you know, courtiers like that sort of drama. His successor was his first cousin once removed, Lady Jane Grey, the granddaughter of Henry VIII's sister. Lady Jane was promoted to the status of Queen on Edward's deathbed as he was concerned that his sister, Mary Tudor, would restore Catholicism and undo his religious reforms. When Jane became queen, in name but not in proclamation, Mary fled to Norfolk and started to gather a massive support system around her. Spa days, sleepovers with her fellow Catholic maiden, and of course, an army. Mary stormed into London triumphantly in August of that year, as she had been declared queen shortly before. Lady Jane was imprisoned in the Tower of London, but not executed, as Mary understood that she was merely a Protestant figurehead rather than a direct threat. By 1554, a new rebellion, Wyatt's Rebellion, aimed to restore Jane as Queen and pressured Mary to execute the young woman, who was barely 18 at this point. With Mary on the throne, the next Tudor to die was the final survivor of Henry VIII's wives, 
Anne of Cleves. Now, Anne of Cleves is perhaps my favourite of Henry VIII's wives, purely because she was a complete badass who managed to have almost everything right with her life. Her divorce settlement said that she would have castles and an annual stipend, meaning that she was getting paid for doing practically nothing and living a lavish lifestyle. In the 1550s, she passed away, however, and historians are unsure why. It was either gout or influenza, but I'm going to go with the latter. After all, England was ravaged by an influenza epidemic under Mary's reign. Unfortunately for Mary, the next four years of her life would be an utter torment. She married her presumed sweetheart, King Philip II of Spain, in 1554, and almost immediately believed she was pregnant. Nine months later, and no baby. Philip fled to England to assist his father's wars, leaving Mary depressed and lonely. When he returned, she once again immediately believed herself pregnant, but she was anything but. Unfortunately, by 1558, it was apparent that she was suffering from ovarian cancer, making her appear pregnant, but with no baby in consequence. The final and perhaps most popular Tudor on this list is none other than Elizabeth I. She came to the throne in her early 20s in 1558, but by 1562, she had had a near brush with death from smallpox. She did survive and remained relatively healthy until her late 60s. By this point, she had an affinity for sugar and was suffering from gum disease. Her friends, including her presumed lover, Robert Dudley, were either dead or had turned against her, leading to the Queen's depression. By the age of 70, it was clear that the Queen was dying, from what is yet again unclear. She may have had blood poisoning, which was common in the early 1600s, usually from application of makeup levied with mercury. She may have also died from pneumonia, since she was unable to leave her bed for almost an entire month. She died in March 1603, ending the Tudor dynasty's control of England. So there we have it, how every Tudor died. Please comment below whose death you found the most interesting, and also give me some comments about what other dynasties or what other royal families around the world you would like me to cover next. As always, I am the Shy Historian, and stay tuned for many more.